Hi there, my name's Sarah Franklin. I'm a science teacher here at VAS. I also am the science curriculum coordinator. I'm very excited to introduce VAS's online lessons um, so that our students can learn at home. Uh, today's lesson I'm going to give is biology for the coordinated science. We're going to look at food webs and the interrelationships that happen between the plants and animals that live on planet Earth. I hope you enjoy the lesson. Hello and welcome to the lesson, uh, the GCSE lesson in biology and today we're going to be talking about organisms in their environment. The first lesson is going to be about energy flow in ecosystems. So the learning objectives that we're going to be covering today are the ecology terminology, so we're going to look at uh, all the keywords and definitions that, we're, that are associated with this topic. Uh, we're going to look at the difference between food chains and food webs. And then we're going to look at the energy losses between trophic levels, and these are the feeding levels um, that happen. So to give us a, an overall, I want you to think about what habitats are there present on Earth? So here we have a map of the world, and you can see all the different coloured regions refer to the different types of habitats that we have on planet Earth. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that we have areas of tropical rainforest. Um, we have these in Vietnam, and uh, you'll see them quite a lot across the equator. Um, Tiger, that is um, more of sort of carnivorous woodland area. Um, we have temperate grassland area, so temperate means kind of warm but cold as well. Then we have desert area where there's not very many uh, plant and animal species, but the plant and animal species that do live there are very highly adapted to things like cacti. Um, we have the tundra, which is very, very close to the poles. Um, not a lot of plant activity goes on here because it is very, very cold almost too cold for photosynthesis. Um, so you get more shrub-like kind of uh, plants living there. We have our temperate forests. So where I'm from in the UK, that's what most of our woodland looks like. Um, so very similar to rainforest, but with just different species of trees. Uh, we have areas where there's dry woodland. So these will be where trees are growing, but it's very, very dry conditions. We have tropical savanna, which is grassland area. Um, so this is where all the lions and type lions and elephants and um, antelope they will live on these these areas. And then finally, we've got the mountainous regions, which can um, vary in this in the types of habitats that are there. Okay, so once you've decided to pause the video to um, have a little look at some of those habitats. So you can just put into your search engine um, the seasonal forests or the grasslands or the tundra. And then if you click on Google Images, uh, then it should come up with some images of, of the kind of environments that you the kind of environment that you would see there and the kind of animals that you would see there as well. Um, the next task I would like you to have a go at is choose one of these these uh, these habitats. And I'd like you to see if you can remember how to draw a food chain. So food chain is about all the animals that eat each other. So where is food getting passed on to? So again, another challenge for you to just Google search one of these habitats and a food chain. If you can get to five, um, five animals in your food chain, you're doing incredibly well. So pause the video and see how you do. OK, so the, here are some examples of um, of some different habitats and some different food chains. Um, so if we look to the top left here, uh, you can see we have an oceanic uh, food chain. So this starts off with the sunlight. Uh, the sunlight um, is captured. The energy is captured by very small uh, organisms living in the in the water. So phytoplankton mainly. So they're the um, they're the ones that will be able to do photosynthesis to create sugars, so they will start the food chain. Um, and we also have uh, zooplankton, so these might be shrimp-like creatures, very, very small, and they will feed on the phytoplankton. Um, then we have groups of small fish. Uh, they tend to filter their way through the water and they capture all of that zooplankton. 
And then those get eaten by larger fish still, such as mackerel, and then even larger fish still, which is uh, the tuna. And then finally, we have our top predator here is the shark. Um, in the, so that's for the ocean, uh, just one of many options that you could have had a look at. Um, if we look at the grasslands, uh, you can see a very typical African scene here of we've got cheetahs hunting after zebras and zebras will then be eating the, the grass. Um, elephants, we've got the, the plant material as well. Not so sure about how many predators um, elephants have, but I do know lions have been known to, to attack them. Okay, and here we've got the Amazon rainforest food web. So here it's quite complicated. There's many, many different species in Amazon rainforest. They're very biodiverse. Um, but here you can see there's an example of, um, we've got our primary consumer down here. So they're eating the, the plant material. And then we've got a jaguar here hiding, hiding behind the tree. Um, so he will be eating the, the little uh, mouse type creature. Um, and yes, yeah, so you can see which animals are eating which in this one. We've got a nice sloth there and a boa constrictor. Boa constrictors are very interesting animals. They're able to wrap their body around an animal and then squeeze it and then they can swallow it whole. So they're, they're quite interesting ones. Um, and then finally, we've got an Arctic food chain. So you can see that the polar bear is the top of the food chain here, he's the top predator. Um, and that food chain starts with algae in the ocean capturing the sun's light. Um, then it goes into the uh, diatoms, which are basically like zooplankton. Um, so these are zooplankton down here, the diatoms and copepods. Uh, they're eaten by small fish, which are eaten by a smaller mammal here. We've got a seal and then a polar bear. So this just gives you an outline of some of the ideas of, of what food webs should look like in different habitats. OK, so what we can see on this slide is a food chain. So you've probably had a look at this before when you've covered it in grade six and grade eight. We've had a look at food chains before, uh, but we're just going to break it down so you know the correct terminology for the items, for the items in the food chain. So we start over here with the grass. Um, we call the grass a producer um, because and producers re re reference to all plants. So plants have the ability to harness the energy from the sun through the process photosynthesis. So photosynthesis takes in the raw materials of water and carbon dioxide and using the light energy from the sun, it converts it into sugar and that sugar that can then be stored in its tissues. So we call the, the plants the producers because they are the ones that are producing the food um, for the rest of them. So the next thing we have um, in our food chain is the primary consumer. And you can see here that we have a grasshopper. So the primary means first and consumer means to eat. You eat something, you take something in. So here we've got the primary consumer. So it's the first thing that is eating something. Uh, in the second part of the food chain, we've got the bluebird and this is the secondary consumer. So the secondary consumer is the second um, animal in the food chain. And it's the second thing that's consuming something else. So it's the secondary consumer. Um, when we get to the third consumer, um, we have to call it a slightly different name. Uh, we call it the tertiary consumer. So you might not have heard that word tertiary before, but it means three. So that is the third one um, in third level, in the trophic levels um, of eating, of, of consuming the animal. So I've written here, each organism represents a trophic level. The word trophic means feeding and nutrition. So each level, each point in the food chain describes a trophic level. OK. Um, so once we get to the top of the trophic levels, um, we generally have our apex predator. So that means our top predator. Nothing else is going to eat that animal. So it could be something like an owl. It could be something like a lion. Quite often it is humans. We are the top predators. It's not often something else will eat us. Um, 
However, when these animals die, they will get decomposed and they'll get decomposed um, by mushrooms like fungi and microorganisms. Um, and what they will do is they will take the dead material and they will uh, digest it using enzymes, breaking it down so into nutrients so that it can be absorbed by those microorganisms. And those microorganisms can then go on as a basis for another food chain. So I would like you to just pause the video here and see if you can tell the difference between a producer, consumer and decomposer. See if you can say a definition. OK, so um, here is some, a group of different pictures and it's probably been taken from a, a, an ecosystem in the UK because um, these are all the types of animals that we have. We've got worms, snails, grass, um, a shrew, which is a very small mouse like creature. We have a weasel here, um, which probably is similar to civet cats uh, that we have here in Vietnam. And then we have an owl and a hedgehog. Hedgehogs are very cute little animals with little prickles on the on the outside of them. So here you can see that we've got a complex of lots of different food chains because a food chain isn't something that really exists in reality because animals don't just eat one type of plant most of the time and animals don't just eat one type of animal. So animals are eating lots of different things and so that means all of these food chains get uh, integrated together and cause a food web. So I want you to have a go and see if you can look at how many food chains there are. So just try and make some notes in your book now about the food chains. Okay. And now you can check your answers. Did you get them all right? Pause the video again to check your answers. OK, so we're going to start moving on to a few more definitions going on. And we're going to talk about what an ecosystem actually is, because the words get um, interchanged with the word habitats quite a lot. So we do need to try and recognise what is the difference. Um, an ecosystem is where all the, living, all the living organisms and their environment are interacting. So all living organisms means anything that's carrying out respiration. So that will be um, plants because they respire at night to be able to grow. Uh, we've got the, all the animals are carrying out respiration um, as well as the microorganisms that live there. So all living organisms um, are represented here However, we're also talking about the environment. So is it is it a pond area? Is it wet? Um, for example, if it's a wetland area, it might not have very much oxygen available in it. Um, so you have to reference your habitat. So for example, a rainforest, you've got um, high humidity of, of water vapor around, and it's generally very, very hot. Um, when, if you look to the North Pole, um, it's very, very cold. And so these environmental factors are important when we talk about an ecosystem. Uh, habitat is more of a specific air, area in that ecosystem. So, for example, you might have a large woodland area, which is made up of many forests, but you might have a habitat of a small um, pond or lake area within that ecosystem. Um, and so the habitat defines a specific area of the ecosystem. OK, what I would like you to do now is um, click on the link about how wolves change the rivers. There's a really nice video here about how they introduced wolves back into Yellowstone Park in the USA. Um, and it was just more of an experiment at first, uh, but it's had massive implications for the health of the ecosystem. So pause the video now and click on the on the link and it should take you to the YouTube site. If you if it's not working, just type into into YouTube how wolves change the rivers. I'd be really interested to know what you think. 
So if you've watched the video, you'll realise that wolves have had a massive impact on the environment in Yellowstone. Um, bringing in the top predator, uh, the apex predator, has been really important in helping move the, um, the deer and the animals that were taking advantage of the large open grasslands. Now those wolves have chased them into, into the wooded areas, which has allowed those grasslands to come back um, and increase the biodiversity of those areas. Um, and then because more of the plant material was able to grow back because they were moving the, the grazers around because they were hunting them, um, they, they've managed to bring more plants um, and more soil structure back into um, the environment and that's actually changed the rivers. It's changed the river system. So it, the, the real thing that I wanted you to get from this is, is the importance of, of these food webs. These animals and these species that live together have got very balanced relationships. And you take one thing out, it disrupts the whole food web. Um, and this is one of the problems that as humans are facing at the moment because of the way that we're treating the earth, a lot of animals are going extinct at the moment and we're removing these animals from their place in the ecosystem, which is then having negative um, knock-on effects about the, the health of the ecosystem. So it's really important that we um, protect our habitats, protect our species, um, because that will ensure the health of the planet for the long term. So for this next um, slide, I'd like you to have a look at these questions because we have a food web here. This is a food web of a woodland area. Um, so see if you can answer these questions. I will answer them in just a moment. Pause the video now. So number one, this is a food web. How is it different to a food chain? Well, it shows you lots of food chains. They're all integrated together and it helps you to understand the relationships between the organisms that live in that ecosystem. What type of ecosystem is this? This is a woodland ecosystem. The arrows represent the flow of energy from one animal to another. Our producers are the oak tree and the leaf litter. So even though they're plants and they've fallen to the ground, they're still important. Consumers then, we have the earthworm, the shrew, the wood mouse, fox, caterpillar, squirrel, owl. Um, I think I've said all of those. And then finally, the decomposer is the fungi. And the final question is, what would happen to the other populations if all the shrews died? So this is where I was talking about the importance of um, having a structure of the food chain and, and what happens when you remove one of those animals. So if you took out the shrews, um, then probably what would happen is there would be there would probably be then a lot of caterpillars because nothing is eating the caterpillars. So the, cat, the number of caterpillars would, would increase because there's no predator, there's nothing to eat it. And if the number of caterpillar increase, then we're going to have um, an increased amount of um, feeding on the oak tree. So this could be quite damaging to the oak tree, especially for these squirrels that live there and rely on its other, um, other food producing parts, which are the, the acorns. So yeah, if we had took out the shrews, we'd probably have a lot more caterpillars. So a key part of the objectives that we need to know about is the key terms and definitions. So I've made a worksheet here. If you want to download the worksheet that goes alongside this video, uh, you can, or you can just have a look at the definitions at the top there. Decide which word you think should go into which box. Pause the video now and I will go through them in a moment. OK, so an organism that makes its own nutrients using sunlight through photosynthesis, that is a producer. An organism that gets energy by eating other organisms is a consumer. 
an organism that hunts for and kills other organisms. They gain energy by eating other animals. These are predators. An organism that is killed by another organism for food, that is called prey. An organism that will consume plants and animals to gain energy, we call these omnivores. So if, if something eats plants and animals, so that's probably humans, we fit into that category. Um, an animal that gets its energy from eating plants, that is a herbivore. And the word herb can help you um, because herb means plant, herbivore. Okay, an animal that gets its energy from eating other animals and other animals only is called a carnivore. The word carn means meat, so it's a meat eater. An organism that gets its energy from dead or waste organic matter and they break it down into nutrients, these are decomposers. An area containing all the organisms and their environment interacting together this is an ecosystem. The total mass of a living organism, energy from food, is converted into this. We haven't quite gone over this yet, but you might have been able to guess from the, one of the keywords at the top. It is biomass. So think of the word mass is the amount of stuff that we have. Bio means life, so it's the amount of live stuff. And then finally, the position of an organism within a food chain is the trophic level. So it's the feeding level that it's on. I hope you got them all right. Now, if you want to have a look at this diagram, this is a little bit different. We haven't seen one of these yet, but this is a pyramid of biomass. So we have the, the food chain represented as we go up and the blue shaded area represents the total amount of mass um, that that living organism has. And then how much of that mass then goes converted into the thing that eats it. So we're looking at the amount of mass that each organism has as it goes through the trophic layers. Okay. So we're going to look at why does the biomass get further, get less as we go further up. OK, so we're going to have a look at the next, the next slide to help us work out why that is. Each organism at each trophic level uses the energy they consume to live. So like you, you are warming up your body right now. You're using it for energy so you can move around. So not all of the energy that you take into your body will get converted into your own biomass because you're using some of that energy. So it means that whenever you go up to the next trophic level, there is less energy available than there was before because the organism before has used some of that, some of that energy for its own living purposes. And it's only converted some of that food that it's ingested into its own body mass, into its own body tissues. So in this next task, um, we've got a horse. What I would like you to think about is what happens to the energy that an organism is consuming. So that horse is going to be eating some grass and it's going to be going into the body. Can you tell me what do you think is happening to all of that food, all of that energy that it's taken into its body? What does it do with it? Sit down for a few minutes now and just try and decide what, how many places will that energy be used for or where will it go? As you can see, this horse is ingesting food and it's ingesting the biomass of the food. So it's taking in all of that mass of the grass and then it takes it into its stomach where it gets digested and it breaks down all of that grass into smaller parts into its nutrients. So some of that energy will be used to convert into new biomass so it will make muscle tissue and nerve tissue and bone tissue and blood so it will be converted into that. Um, another part of the food will be used for cellular respiration 
So respiration occurs in every single one of your cells where it converts oxygen and glucose into carbon dioxide and water, and it releases the energy from that. If you notice, uh, respiration is the opposite equation of photosynthesis. So the energy that gets absorbed in photosynthesis will actually get released here in respiration. So that's what help allows us to keep our bodies warmer than the environment through that energy that we produce through respiration. Uh, but not all of it gets converted into either new horse or for respiration. Um, as you know, um, it's going to come out the back end, some of it as well. So we say some of the biomass will be lost as faeces. So that's the technical word for poo. And we have biomass lost in urine as well, uh, which will mainly be composed of water, but it does have some nutrients in there as well. So as you can see, the energy being transferred from one from one part of the food chain to the next, the en there is energy that get, gets lost along the way. So these, this diagram just allows you to see what you can do um, with, with the food that we could, we're able to produce. So on the bottom layer, you can see we have plant material, we have corn. And if that corn is feeded, is fed directly to humans, you can get one, two, three, four, five, six. We can have 10 people being fed from that amount of corn. Um, if we look at a food chain that's got like three trophic levels in it, we can see that as because we have um, these cows here, they, they take in the, the energy from the corn, but they're using a lot of that energy for, um, for respiration and a lot of it gets lost in their feces. So some of the energy is being wasted. So that will then go to feed one person. Let's, let's say that this is over a, a year or something like that. So um, this diagram represents how energy can be lost through the trophic levels. So I just wanted to include this slide here. Um, Veganism is something that's on the rise at the moment. There are many reasons why people are choosing to, to become vegan. Um, it might be for planet reasons, because beef, beef production in agriculture can produce a lot of greenhouse gases um, and use a lot of water. Um, and the other reasons for being vegan um, are the animal welfare standards, but also there's a lot of research out there that's saying that being vegan is very good for your health. Something uh, that's it's up to people, the individuals, what they decide to do with in terms of their diet. But here you can see there's a, one of the compelling reasons to go um, to go vegan is the fact that you can use um, you can use your your plant production, your land your land area to produce plant food, which can then go directly into feeding humans. Whereas if you were to take that same area of, of farmland and feed those plants to your cow first, um, then the amount of quality food that you get out of it at the end is, a much, is much less. So by having the animal in the middle, uh, there's, a, there's a lower transfer of energy. And so you can't feed as many people. So being vegan would allow more people to be fed in the world with more, with more food. So what you can do now is you can try answering some of these questions. So again, pause the video and um, on the next couple of slides, we'll have the answers there ready for you to check your work. So I hope you were able to answer those questions correctly. And um, just to summarise the lesson, today we've been looking at food webs and we've been looking at the energy flow from one species to, to another. We can understand that all the energy 
uh, for life on Earth comes from the sun, principally from the sun. The sun's energy is able to convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose. And that is our foundation for all of the food energy that we have on the planet. So these food webs of complex systems that are in many different habitats, um, they're quite fragile systems. If you remove one animal, if you take one out, it can have um, a disruptive effect on, on the animals um, across the rest of the food webs. So that's something that we need to look at. And the, and the wolves gave us a really exact good example of that. Um, then we had a look at bio, uh, we had a look at the key definitions. Um, so we need to know the definitions of uh, producers and consumers, herbivores, omnivores, carnivores, prey and predator, ecosystem and habitat. Oh, and we also need to know decomposers as well. And then finally, we've had a look at um, how energy gets transferred between the trophic levels and how energy is used by the animals when they're, after they've fed, they use energy for respiration. Some of it's excreted out as well. So the transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next can sometimes be inefficient. And that's why if we are going to solve some of our problems that we have today, um, one of those things is being able to feed the 7 billion people that we have on this planet we need to start addressing um, our food chains and our food webs and our ecosystems and habitats to ensure that we're going to have healthy production of food in the future. Thank you very much for listening. My name is Sarah Franklin and you are tuned into a biology GCSE lesson on organisms in their environment. Thank you. Goodbye.